I'm Steve Lyons, First Christian Church, Milton Freewater. Uh, this July 26th is it already. Uh, we've been looking at the Acts of the Holy Spirit, Acts of the Apostles, and today we're in chapter 10 of Acts and looking at a, a lesson called Tinted Lenses, and that's, that's why I have my sunglasses on right now. I wear these quite often during the summer months, and then my wife gave me another pair here that we use for, uh, or I use for cutting down glare when driving but I find that they're just wonderful. The yellow lenses are great for cloudy days to help kind of boost my, uh, my mood, and it looks springy and wonderful out. Whenever I wear those, my mind often goes to the person that shared with me that everybody looks through life through tinted lenses. Our li through, because of our life experiences and our perspective, we, we look at life through different ways and different means. It's true about our cultural issues as well, and more germane to our topic today is of spiritual things as well. We look at Bible stories through tinted lenses, which is and can be beneficial when our struggles provide us understanding and empathy to speak uh, to others in similar circumstances that we find ourselves with a hope that has given us strength in Jesus Christ's name. However, our tinted lenses can also be detrimental when they hinder us uh, from vision of deeper spiritual truths. Last week we looked at a story of God blinding Saul so that Saul would open his spiritual eyes and see God's bigger purpose for his life. And that was a great case in point. And that chapter is really just a precursor of this much more consequential topic that we're discussing today. Acts chapter 10 is a story of contrasts. Luke spends a great deal of time and uses a literary technique to just repeat his stated point regarding two different lives, two different visions to bring home one huge, powerful, divine truth that leads to a decisive encounter and brings a world-changing revelation. I always begin my studies by asking, myself, what is God trying to convey in this passage? And in Acts chapter 10, it's pointing out that God is a God of the universe, and not just a single uh, select nation like Israel. It demonstrated here that through a Gentile who had a heart for God and a Jewish man who was reluctant to follow God's voice when it conflicted with his own religious notions. God's bigger purpose is to wipe away centuries of religious prejudices uh, for those who fear him and act rightly. The story begins in Caesarea with a centurion named Cornelius. Caesarea was a major trading port uh, that was completely built from 22 to 10 BC by Herod the Great and was named in honor of his patron, Caesar Augustus. It was a modern city with a Roman temple, amphitheater, a 20,000 seat hippodrome, and the technological marvel of the day, a man-made artificial barrier, a harbor that was built out of concrete blocks. It was the seat of Herod's uh, Roman authority in Palestine, so that any soldiers that were stationed there would have been, it would have been a distinct honor for them that was reserved for the best of the best. And Cornelius uh, was that man. He was a very, it was a very common name, Cornelius. It was named in honor of Cornelius Sulla, who had freed 10,000 Roman slaves back in 82 BC. Our Cornelius was from Italy, and likely also a freed slave. His rank of centurion meant that he was a leader of about 100 Roman soldiers, the occupying force, that of course was controlling Judah. Centurions advanced up through the ranks from foot soldier, and that required a demonstrable leadership quality, as well as being a steady and sensible soldier in the face of the enemy. But also, when overwhelmed and hard pressed, they had to demonstrate a willingness to stand fast and die at their post. So undoubtedly, Cornelius, advanced, having gained numerous scars, which may account for why he was a seeker. He was seeking for higher purpose, and he had found it. He was called a God-fearer because 
It means he was a devout follower of Israel's God. But he wasn't a proselyte. He wasn't a Gentile who fully embraced the Jewish religion. But scripture does state that he was, his whole family were believers, suggesting that he modeled his faith always, thus providing a positive influence to all those that were around him. Cornelius has a vision, we hear. And he hears from the Lord's messenger, an angel, telling him that even though he is a Gentile, God hears and he affirms his prayers and he accepts those wonderful gifts that Cornelius gives to the poor. The Lord then commands him to send for Simon Peter from Joppa, which he obeys immediately by sending three men. The following day of praying, Simon Peter also sees a vision that repeats itself three times. Unclean am animals are let down upon a sheet and a voice tells him to go, get up, kill them and eat. Of course, Peter is recoiling at this, at the thought of doing it because he had never, he said, eaten anything that was the Old Testament had forbidden him to do. And he argues that, that he'd never eaten unclean things to this voice, of which the voice responds, do not call anything impure what God has made clean. And after that third vision, Peter has little time to think about what has just happened when they get a knock on the door and the three men were there. And he begins at that time to realize that God is behind all of this and so invites them in to stay the night and they all leave together for Caesarea the next morning. Completely trusting God, that God has planned this all out and had it organized and it was gonna go just according to what he said. Cornelius had already invited and began hosting the guests in his house as they eagerly await Paul's arrival. I mean, Peter's arrival, excuse me. As he shows up, Cornelius kneels down in homage to Peter, but Peter refuses such an honor, saying, Stand up, I am also only a man. Because he recognizes God alone deserves that honor. He is but a sinner saved by grace. So we see these two very different men that had two very different visions walking into this room together as equals. And Peter introduces himself to the crowd by stating, uh, as a Jew, I'm not supposed to even enter into this through this door, which sounds rather arrogant until you realize he's admitting the tinted lenses that have to come off because God is showing him the error of his theology. As a Jew, Peter was raised believing God had handpicked Israel out of partiality, not as an act of grace. They had all been ignoring numerous Genesis uh, passages stating God selected them so that the world would be blessed through them. Like the tinted lenses of, of neighboring nations who were worshiping their own false national gods, Israel also was treating God as their own personal possession, even though they knew and identified God, Yahweh, as the creator of the heavens and the earth. One of my favorite scenes out of one of my favorite movies, Finding Nemo, is when the seagulls are fighting over that little fish named Nemo. And instead of screeching, the seagulls all begin saying, mine, 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 mine. It was such a cute play on words that we know originates with children who refuse to share their toys. And I say that because that's exactly what the Jews were doing. They refused to share what they perceived was mine, selfishly, trying to keep the blessing of God to themselves. The reason God chose the nation Israel wasn't that they were alone were to be blessed, but that they were to be a blessing to the world. God tears down that huge barrier that's between this chosen nation and the rest of the world. And Peter acknowledged this when he says, but God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. 
Though his vision is different from Cornelius's, Peter recognizes the connection there. Cornelius's vision was one of an invitation for two sides to meet. And Peter's vision of, of impure animals was a much deeper meeting than just nutritional things. The Galatians were considered an unclean people. So the Jews avoided them. It wasn't because God expressly uh, forbid it, but because Gentiles did not keep a kosher household. So eating with them meant very likely that Jews would be ceremonially unclean, which meant they were required to go through a, a lengthy purification rites before they were clean again. And that's why Peter could invite them into his house, but he could not enter into theirs. And so by extension, God's dietary laws, the Jews had shunned Gentile company, calling them unclean. And when his vision removed all dietary restrictions, Peter realized that connection, that no person should be considered unclean. That rule was removed as well. Peter later argues this point before the, the Jerusalem council when he says, God made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. How these two men respond to God comes out of their completely different tinted lenses of life experiences. Two completely different men had two totally different visions, but one thing in common, a devotion to the one true God whom they worship. And in recognizing this, they see fulfillment in Matthew 8, 11, that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. I love to hear Cornelius' response to why they had called Peter. He restated how the angel visited him and told him to send for Peter, and then he speaks directly to Peter and says, it is good for you to come. Now we are here in, in the presence of God, to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Wow, what a powerful reminder to Christ Church then and today that the fields of harvest are ready. If only believers are willing to reach out in love and share their story of Jesus Christ. And Peter does just that. He shares the gospel of good news about Jesus Christ and just as he is concluding his remarks saying, everyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins through his name, God powerfully punctuates that sentence by filling all of the hearers with the Holy Spirit. The Bible process usually is believe and repent and confess and be baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, but God can do what he wants, and so he changes that role around. The reason for that is he puts the Holy Spirit before baptism to show all believers that he does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. His mission is to all people. And as theologian Fulks Jackson says, Peter uses the keys of the kingdom to open the door of faith to Gentiles. And so he does by proclaiming, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water in the name of Christ? We see how these two men, Cornelius and Peter, were united by their shared faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And scripture says that all humankind, when united we are all united, I should say, as sinners and without hope. Hope is found when Christ Church lovingly shares that gospel story. May our, all people be united through the one who saves by the blood of our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you.